tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are director Ellen Shipley and another director, Judy Chaikin. New York native Ellen Shipley, who is known for her Grammy-nominated recording performances, as well as her award-winning songwriting, graduated from Hunter College as a theater major. Enjoying a career involving TV, films, concerts, and radio, Ellen returns to the love of her theater as the director of Desert Sunrise, which is at the Lillian Theater in uh, Hollywood. Is it true your career path started at three years old? That is completely <laughs> true. Yes, it is. That sounds funny, doesn't I it? I know, My it career does. career started at three? It does, but it's true. It is. How did, that, how did that really happen? Well, my parents took us up to the Catskill Mountains at the time, and there were these hotels where these bands were playing big band music. And I was sitting at a little <laughs> table with my parents, and the band was playing. And then all of a sudden, my parents are hearing all of this sort of teetering laughter. And they turn around, I'm completely gone, and they look up on the stage, and I've taken the microphone away from the singer. You walked up there? <laughs> I did. <laughs> and it was long from the back to where we were in the tables all the way to the front, but I was just completely determined that I was going to sing When the Moon Hits Your Eye Like a Big Pizza Pie. That's the only thing I can remember about that. And they, and they were playing that? And they played, and they loved it. it. They loved it. Well, after three, mm -hmm. you started taking <laughs> <laughs> you did start taking acting classes with uh, some very well-known teachers. I did. I studied acting uh, with some incredible people over at the Neighborhood Playhouse, some at Actors Studio. Uh -huh. Mostly, I began with the great teachers at Hunter College. I was very lucky the years that I was there. Lloyd Richards and Mike Ruttenberg and uh, Harold Clerman had just left, really? and I just and they really went to Broadway. They were do working on Broadway and doing lots oh, of great things. Oh, they right? did, and they were taking some breathers and coming back to academia. And I just happened to luck out and be there in the years when some of these really well-known directors it's, took me under their wing. It's such a good school. Oh, it's amazing. It has amazing. a really great theater department. I know, and lots of great art. Uh, people in the art yeah. department too. Um, since you were writing, since you write music, and since you're a singer, did you do musical theater? I did. You, uh -huh. I'm the only brunette who played Laurie in Oklahoma probably three times. Oh, you did do that. <laughs> By the time I was 12. <laughs> ah. I did. I did do musicals. I did straight, straight ahead Broadway kind of musicals in community theater and then off, off Broadway. And then I also did what we used to call sort of avant-garde, new, strange, going through groundbreaking is what, what we thought we were doing, <laughs> concepts of music with uh, theater together. And at the same time as you, you were doing that and writing your music, you have, have a long list of really well-known celebrities who, or I shouldn't say celebrities, really, who sang your songs. Are they celebrities? They still, they uh, they're, they're, they're great recording artists. Recording artists is better, yeah. Tell um, us who those were. Well, I really got my first break with Belinda Carlisle, who was one of the Go-Go's. Right. And st they still are together, but she was doing a solo career, and she sang one of my songs, two of my songs in a first solo album, and they just went skyrocketing, and I thought, hmm, starving as a recording artist, eating as a songwriter. I think I'm going to take the eating as a songwriter. So you stopped <laughs> So I stopped recording and I went on to songwriting. But how did you get all, how did you get your songs out there for those people to find them? Well, you know, it's be between knowing some people uh -huh. just through the years of being around the business and I 
I was signed by EMI, Virgin Music, actually, at the time. And when you give them your songs, they go out and oh. they hook you up with different artists, recording artists, celebrities, to, to hopefully do your songs. I see, I see. That's how it gets started. Mm. And so, as you were, you continued, you still songwrite? I do. I songwrite, though, mostly now for pleasure. So, so you're still songwriting, but then how did directing come along? Here you were performing, singing, acting, um, doing all these theater, film things, and now you're directing. Because directing was my first love. I mean, other than singing and performing, which I loved, I enjoyed acting a lot, but I always found that when I was acting, I was thinking about what everybody else was supposed to be doing and how the lights could be better oh, this you, way. You were doing it and yourself. How, and I was <laughs> mentally directing everything. And then, so by the second year I was at school, I wouldn't shut up, and they said, okay, put her in the directing program. I was going to say, some director is going like, oh, what is this woman doing to me, right? You know? Well, no, I kept it to myself. You did keep it to I just was smiling, going, this isn't working. Why can't they? see what they should be doing. <laughs> so bringing that full circle, we have Desert Sunrise, which is uh, at the Lillian Theater. Mm -hmm. And you brought this beautiful painting, which is the painting of the poster, I guess. Yes. This was done by Danuta Rothschild, who's an amazing artist, does a lot of work. Uh, she understood the concept of the play. My producer, Anita Lee, approached her about doing the artwork for Desert Sunrise. She did it, and um, it's, it's really representational, <coughs> excuse me, of what the play is. Well, is it a musical? No. It's not it, a it's, musical. No, it's not a musical. It's a play that has music kind of that underscores and enhances the story. Have you written that music? No, I didn't. Oh, so it isn't anything that would be a musical. It's strictly a dramatic piece. It's a very dramatic piece. It's a, it's a compelling, provocative, co somewhat controversial, political, and really humanistic piece. Written by Misha Shulman. Written by Misha Shulman. And he incorporates all of the elements of the region and, and, and be to, about the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, and in that, within the storyline, there's all the music and the art. And he wanted to incorporate the joy and that realm of possibilities within the storyline as well. Uh, did you go to the Hebron re uh, area to research? No. Directing. You didn't go to Hebron? No. Um, my daughter actually went to Israel last year, but I had no time between trying, <laughs> between saying that I was going to do this play and getting permission from him in our conversation. I, I would love to have taken a field trip with the whole cast there. Well, it's very volatile, isn't it? I mean, very. it's a very volatile area. Was, Misha, was Mr. Shulman actually there? Were these his own experiences? Yes. Oh, they were. He was there. His father was there. There was a group called Tayush, which is made up of Israel, Israel as well, well, Jewish and Arab. Uh, members who go oh, they it went they mixed and they it's a peace organization they went actually into the South Hebron Hills and into the occupied West Bank and would see what was going on with the Palestinian shepherds and with the settlers and they began really working towards trying to help in the region help the shepherds really and so this they wrote addresses a book. that this, this play? the play addresses part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's not an attempt to resolve it, or, and it's not an attempt to go into it all historically from the very beginning, or we would be sitting there for 3,000 years more. I don't know, <laughs> but it would be a, a, <laughs> Yes, but that's, but, but that's true. It's funny that you said Abraham, because that's, that is part of it. All no, but of there's us the being tree of Abraham, Abraham there. That's right. I, mean, I know, exactly. I've been in that, and it was like pretty scary to go down. Many times we were in Israel, we weren't allowed to go down into oh, that really? area. Oh, really? Yeah. So um, this play is played on off Broadway. It's played in Chicago. Um, did you see the production in those places, or what do you no. bring? What do you bring to this play that those directors uh, didn't bring, or how do you compare? What do you do? Well, I think that what I tried to do uh, first and foremost is be true to Misha's concept of 
of the play, of, of how he sees it, why he wrote it. And it's my job as a director to bring that truthfully and faithfully and honestly to an audience. He's the one who directed the other production. So it's, gonna be, it's very interesting because he obviously had a very personal and subjective uh, viewpoint of his own play. Yes, that would be difficult, probably. And to bring you in as a new eye. Does he sit next to you? Have I you haven't even met him yet. Is that right? I have not met him. Only over the, we've only spoken over the phone oh, so and he, emailed. He isn't there holding your hand saying this is no. the way I did it. No, thank God, yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the way he would do it. I, um, I think that each director, of course, is going to bring their, their own perceptions and visuals and concepts and what they want to say. Uh, for me, it's much more about what goes beyond the political storyline to the universal search for acceptance and understanding and forgiveness and how we really are some taught somehow to be enemies, but we don't know if there were not those expectations, how we really would be with each other. It sounds and very moving. It sounds it's very like you're moving. really like at the core of what's going on. How did you cast it? Or did you cast it? Well, I had a casting agent, Russell did Bost, who was incredible. Uh, we looked for a young cast, because when you think about the war and the hostility and everything that goes on, not just in that region, but in all regions where there's war, um, it's really children who are the victims, and it's children who are fighting. And so I wanted a cast that was ethnically diverse and true to the Arab and, and the Jewish culture. And I wanted people who were young because he, these were the people and these are the people who fight these wars, are the children. Exactly. Because they have to put in their time, don't they? Yes. I mean, they're required to put in during their youth to join the army. Mm -hmm. And they're taught to do just what you're saying, that if they weren't taught to do those things or to fight each other, they'd probably be going in the hills together. Right. Uh, hence the play. <laughs> <laughs> Desert. <laughs> Desert Sunrise, right? Yes. And the, the one thing uh, when we were talking about Misha Shulman, he actually directed it and acted in it too, didn't he? He acted in at, some at, of those. At some of them he did. So I, I have already cast this again. You and he are going to be in it. Uh-huh. Uh, we're the parents. You're going to be. <laughs> And let's see what happens when you do it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, well, I would love to do that. I, I'll be the rock. I don't really care. <laughs> oh, it's it been be really nice, Alan it's Shipley, a pleasure. to have you with us. And thank you for watching this part of the show. We're going to be back with Judy Chaikin. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Angelino, Judy Chaikin, graduated from Roosevelt High School in East L.A. and from L.A. City College's drama department. She participated in that prestigious American Film Institute directing workshop for women, is a filmmaker, a theater director, and a former actor in TV and film, and her first job was directing, was it, at the Roxy? My first job directing at the Roxy was with a, uh, a show called Woman Speak, which was written by Gloria Goldsmith. And it starred uh, a lot of very wonderful women. And eventually, we went on to do a production of it. Uh, at, well, that was the production we did with uh, Jane Fonda and Diane Ladd. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, was it was great. a good way to start directing. <laughs> really? So did that lead you to the AFI w workshop, or did you no, go the other way around? How no, I, it, from, from that I started directing a lot of theater, and the thing that led me to the AFI workshop is um, I, I wanted to get into the film business, and uh, somebody had asked me if I knew of someone who could be an, a... Uh, an intern on a, uh, a commercial. And I said, yeah, me. That was smart. Yeah, and I was already, you know, pretty seasoned and well on. And yet I said, well, if I want to start, I want to start at the bottom and learn everything there is to learn. 
And so I did that. I started as an intern, then became a PA, and then eventually produced and directed for that company. Is that right? Yeah, so once I was into working as uh, in the film business, the AFI thing came along. That's what we always tell people to do. Kids want to start at the top. Right. They don't want to start at the bottom. And it's not that much more time consuming, is it, to learn all those things? No, and it's absolutely important. You know, a lot of kids get out of college and they think, well, I've learned everything there is to learn. Right. Well, the one thing they haven't learned is how the business works. And also, you got your foot in and you started working for that company right. in, in, what, a short time, probably? Yeah, I think I, it took me two years from the but time I started as an intern until the time I was actually directing and producing for them. Well, that's a pretty short time. Yes. You worked at the Groundlings, too. Yes, I did. You were there five years because Jerry Charlson said that he knew you when you were at the Groundlings. Exactly, exactly. And that must have been a blast. That was just a <laughs> wonderful, wonderful time of my life and made some of the best friends I've ever had and worked with some of the most brilliant people that I've been able to work with. Just tell us a little bit about the Groundlings. Is it all improv? Well, it's, uh, yes, it's improv, but it also incorporates writing. Uh. Um, there's classes, and I started out by teaching classes and directing the Sunday Company. I was going to ask you what you taught. Yes. The uh, Sunday Company means what? Sunday the Company people? means the people who have graduated from the grounding classes and are being prepared to put be put into the main company. I see. So I had the great good fortune of working with some absolutely brilliant people there, um, Julia Sweeney, Paul Rubens, uh, John Lovitz. Yeah, John Lovitz. Who was who was the other one? Uh, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Kudrow. Um, it was just a whole rash <laughs> of brilliantly talented people, and you know it was just a joy to go to work every day. So. And they were really talented. They, they were were you teaching talented. them? I taught them. Uh, in some of them were in my classes. Some of them had come from other people's classes, and I directed all of them in oh, the in the Sunday company. Did you know they were going to be? that they were that talented? Could you tell when they were students? You could tell right away who was really brilliant. And who was going to separate from yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So then you went on to a one-woman show on Broadway, or a one-woman show came along. Well, eventually. I'm kind of going it, through your bio. This is sort of my <laughs> theater bio. I had, a, I had one foot in the film business and one foot in the theater business all the time. At the same time. All yeah. the time. So, but the, uh, yes, then I directed a show off-Broadway with a woman named Annie Corzin, who was a regular oh, on right. Seinfeld. Right. And Annie, um, we started that show off-Broadway, eventually moved to Broadway, and now we're getting ready to do another show. And uh, we're going to open it at the uh, West Coast Ensemble Theater in November of this year, and then it's opening in Boston with her in March. Yes, she's doing another show. Is it a different show? A or new the show, same one? a brand new show. She wrote it. Yes, she wrote it, and I directed and it. And you'll direct it. Mm -hmm. And and talking about one woman shows. Yes. Uh, so you're directing Rose. Right now, I'm directing Rose at the Odyssey Theater. Right. And uh, who's starring in that? Rose is uh, is being played by Naomi Newman. Naomi is from a theater company in San Francisco called the Traveling Jewish Theater. And uh, last year, she won the San Francisco Best Actress Award for her portrayal of Rose. She's absolutely brilliant in but, this. But Rose was was on Broadway. Yes, Olympia Dukakis played Rose on Broadway. Yes, and it was a it was a big award winning. Um, it's a brilliant, play, right? Yeah. It's a brilliant script, and uh, it's and a who wrote Martin it? Sherman, and it's a really brilliant piece of work. It's gotten wonderful reviews and. Um, we had our first audience last night, and uh, they gave her a standing ovation. Oh, how great. Yeah, so. So while well, you're doing that, you're also uh, talking about a lot of awards. Your big award winner was Cotillion 65. You got a lot of awards on Well, that. I did. That's a short film that I did. But for me, my big award winner <laughs> is my documentary. <laughs> which, which Your Emmy was, Award. My Emmy. No, which, yeah, nominated. Uh, Emmy nominated documentary, which was Legacy of the Hollywood Blacklist. So. And weren't, but weren't there a lot of books written on that? Did you use those books All for research? All of them, yes. Oh, you did. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of research on that. Researched it for a long time. It took a long time to make it, but it was a really wonderful part when, of my life. W um, when you make something for PBS, who funds it? Well, I found most of the funding by grants, by small grants, oh, uh, applications right? for grants. Oh, so that and takes a long time because once you, it takes a long time it to takes get around. It takes forever. Right? That, that film took me <laughs> eight years to make. But I got a lot of, um, it, as the film went along and it got developed, 
I got a lot of private investors, people who just wanted to see it get finished. I see. And they donated to the film because, you know, those things are, uh, you can donate to them. They're tax deductible. So. Right. So that's why I was wondering who, when, do they commission you, PBS, or no. was it just shown there because it was what their quality of work? Well, what it was was I got the film three quarters of the way done, and then I, I went see. to see with them, I and see. they said, yeah, we like this. We'd like to help you finish it. They put up money to finish it, and they I had see. the right to show it. Also, uh, Building on a Dream was a... That was another Emmy nominee. Yeah, right. <laughs> this I want to bring is, these little like, things this up, is, right? like the, a quick version of my, my biggest hits. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Building on a Dream was a film that I made about the um, NoHo uh, Art Gallery. That's a 15-block long work of art. I don't think a lot of people know about this. But the NoHo uh, in City, New York? It, no, here. Oh, NoHo here? NoHo here. It's the, uh, on Chandler Boulevard in North Hollywood. Uh -huh. There is a 15 block long work of art done by 20 different artists. Oh, it's not Judy Baca. No. But she did a, long, a mural in North Hollywood uh, in that area. Yes. Oh, I see. This yes. is totally different. This, this is like 15 blocks long, and it's different artists uh, on every block. How long was that documentary? Uh, it took about a year to make that and, one. And time-wise on air? Time-wise, I think the documentary ended up being, uh, I think we were, it was almost an hour, about 50 minutes. And then what about Bla the Blacklist documentary? That's, was that that's also? an hour. Mm -hmm. it, oh, there, right. so that, that, is that kind of a well, framework? That was the framework. The one I'm working on now is going to be a feature length because now documentaries have started playing in theaters, so you can make them longer. So it's the girls in the band, yes. which you're working on now. Yes, exactly. And, and that's going to be a feature length? Right, and that's a documentary about women jazz instrumentalists, not singers, but instrumentalists, a very little known area but, of but, jazz. But that must be easier, aren't there a lot of them? Well, playing the, in bands? There and? are, but the, nobody knows about them, so that's the kind of why it's interesting. I guess we know jazz singers because they front the band. Right. And they get all the publicity, and people do a lot of things about them. What kind of format do you follow? I, I mean, documentaries used to be the forbidden D word, mm -hmm. and now everyone wants to see documentaries, and they're so interesting, and they're done with such style and creativity. Uh, but there must be a certain form that well, fits the box. Well, that you know, that's the thing about documentaries. There is no form. <laughs> You're free to make the form up yourself. <laughs> And, uh, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> but uh, with the documentary, the way I work, and this is not the way everybody works, but the way I work is I kind of follow my nose and follow my instincts. I have an idea. I have a subject that I'm interested in. I start shooting. I start looking at what I've got. When I start putting it together, then I say, hmm, I need a little more of that. Uh, so I you I'll write it that. all? I write and direct. And then what about the music? Well, in this documentary, all the music is being provided by the women because sure. they're the <laughs> artists. So we did a wonderful thing. We followed a big band called Diva. They're out of New York. And we took a little bus trip with them. Oh. And we went upstate, and they played two concerts, one at a school and one at an opera house in Geneva, New York. And so we filmed all of that. Oh, and that's, that's cool. kind of the spine of the story. And then all the past and everybody else jumps off from that. So do you go to business people and ask for funding? I mean, would you go to like the music industry? I have. I, my original ca funding came from somebody in the music I industry. See. And then the rest of my funding came from some very benevolent investors who want to see me finish the film. What about... Um, Calling in your favors, we talked, to, I mean, a long list of celebrities who were really important, have important uh, careers now. Do you call those kind of people in to help you with voiceovers and things like that, or do you use voiceover? Uh, I try not to use voiceover. Oh. Um, I did in, in the first one, in the Blacklist film, my voiceover narrator was Burt Lancaster. Actually, he was an on-camera narrator, too. <laughs> but in this one, the women tell the story so compellingly that I'm not going to use voiceover. I'm going to let them tell their own story. So they tell the story. Well, in Rose, uh, which we were talking about, that which you're directing at the Odyssey Theater, um, that's a one uh, woman telling her story. Right. Right. So she right. tells it all herself, or do you have other people no, telling it? No, she's alone on stage, two hours. It's a it's a tour de force, 
It's an, she's an amazing actress, and to just see her do this is dynamic. Tell us a little bit. The story is about a Ukrainian woman, is it? It's about a Ukrainian woman who gets who goes to Warsaw and gets caught up at the beginning of the war in the Warsaw ghetto, and how she lives her life and uh, how she perceives life and what her perception of what has happened to her is and the great hope for her and all her people of her generation of course was Israel was Palestine to go to Israel that they would end up there and she is on the famous boat the Exodus the oh. one that took all the people the refugees to Israel and then was turned away and sent back to Germany and it became a cause celebre and was one of the reasons that we have Israel because of uh, the United Nations was so shocked by what had happened. Was this a true story, Rose? Uh, I understand that it's partially based partially. on Martin Sherman's grandmother. I wondered. But it's a much larger story. The character that it embodies is fabulous and she has a very wild and exciting life and, and it's, it's a very magical piece of work. What, do you use music? We use very little music. What, do you use choreography? No, it's just very simple staging. She's storytelling, she's sitting in a chair like you on a bench, and she's telling her story. A Little bit of movement, she gets up a couple of times. Mainly, it's storytelling. That's fabulous. It is fabulous. And I think you love to tell stories, don't you? I do too. That's why I like doing these one woman shows. You get to tell stories. Right. Well, we're so happy you were with us today. Well, thank you so much, Joan. It's really been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you, and thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Email me, J A Q U I N N, the numeral one, at AOL.com. And if you want to ride 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.